Hi, everyone. This is Jim Jackson. Welcome to the forum. And my host, Florence Carmella, has been uh, getting all well with her orange juice and all her little homemade things that she's been doing, her tea. And I'm very excited that she's back <laughs> because we've had a guest that we've been talking about all week. And why don't you introduce this person, Florence? Yes. Hello, Jim. It's nice to be back. And I'm very excited about our special guest today because not only is he an iconic rock star, but he's also an amazing actor. And his name is Michael DeBar. And Michael, it's so nice to have you here. Welcome. Uh, so what oranges? What teas? What's the matter with you? <laughs> Are you ill? Yeah. What's I had a spot of the flu that I was getting over, and I was basically uh, living on tea, soup, and anything else, any other magical remedy I can get my hands on. But I am feeling a lot better. Thank you. <laughs> well, I am a magic remedy. Are you? I am so excited to be talking to you. I've been a fan <laughs> of yours for years. Oh, so definitely Lord. happy that I'm able to do this. Well, I'm delighted to be with you, Science and Jim, of course. Thank you. Well, you, I'm so, going to start right off the bat. I'm going to hog this. Okay, go ahead. A yeah. lot of our, a lot of our friends have been talking about probably the greatest musical exhibition ever. And it was for Live Aid in 1985. 40% of the world, not the United States, the world was watching this event. And Michael was the lead singer a power station because Robert Palmer had departed to do whatever he was doing in the studio. Could you tell us about that? Because my friends are, are waited with a bated breath to talk about that experience. One, to take over for Robert Palmer, and two, to actually perform in such a huge audience. Well, one thing, uh, Mick Jagger wanted 60%, so he was very upset. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, what, what are you going to say? I dropped in a few days before the gig. You know, I was in this band with Steve Jones and the Sex Pistols, and we supported Duran at a show in California. And Andy watched that show and liked it, cut to a year later, and Robert decided not to be with the power station and I, and I think because you know he's a very sophisticated artist and, and, and Duran Duran were really a pop rock group you know mm -hmm. it was very different and I think that he didn't really uh, wasn't too excited about um, playing to 20,000 topless teenage girls I however <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> was tremendously excited about that and for the next three days, I learned every song in the book. You know, they had 37 songs. And I, you know, even though Live Aid, magnificent, I'll talk about that. But just the getting the gig, learning the, the, the songs, you know, I was in uh, Texas with Don Johnson, who's making a movie, an old friend of mine. You, some of you guys will know that. Okay. I, yeah. I, I went to New York. I... Um, went to meet this band who I didn't know who, even who they were. I got a call from their promoter saying, you know, we need a singer, come to New York, what are you doing this summer? Well, that summer I had that song Obsession that was number one all over the world. And I was uh, feeling really good. I flew to New York I, and I went into this office and there was a, a John Taylor and Tony Thompson sweating profusely, very nervous, six month tour booked. So I go in the power station studio, take Robert's vocals off, get on a plane, go to London, sing for Andy Taylor, who was like the boss of that outfit, mm -hmm. fly back the next day to New York. And the following day, I start rehearsals, three days. Then they oh, were asked wow. to do Live Aid. So then I go, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, a couple of billion people, no problem. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I, I think it was so pressured that I didn't feel any pressure. You know, there's moments in your life where things are happening so fast and it's really an amazing feeling. And I've been lucky to be exposed, yes. if you pardon the pun, to that experience. So, uh, you know, I was so confident and so, because what could go wrong? And who <laughs> cared? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Geez. <laughs> I mean, you know, you got Madonna, you got Mick, you got Dylan, you got, I mean, Tina Turner, you know the lineup. I oh, thought, yeah. okay, if this is about anything, it's about raising money for these starving people. It's not about whether you remember the words to get it on. You know, so I, it, it, the perspective on it hit me just as we were walking on stage. And I thought, I'm going to have a, a, the greatest afternoon of my life. And I did. Sure. And it was. And, and it was an amazing feeling. And it was a baptism of, of, 
of fire for sure. And then we went on the road the next day for the next six months. But it, it was wow. a really wonderful feeling. I think I think the major takeaway from it for your friends who are this, uh, interesting in the history and the legacy of it was that we all stayed in the same hotel that night. Mm. Mm. Now, if you wow. think Bohemian Rhapsody was a good movie, <laughs> if you, if you <laughs> shot that night at that hotel with those people, I think we'd all be arrested. <laughs> <Yeah>. And we'd, <laughs> we'd still be in jail. You know, uh, in our in our skin tight orange jumpsuits. Sure. Um, <laughs> I mean, it was a crazy night. So you know, yeah, the history of it is immense. I think, for me, the importance of it has grown over the years. At the time, it was such an incredible, explosive moment that I, you know, I didn't have time to get upset or nervous or, or you know, introverted. <laughs> that was not the time to be any of those things. Sure. Uh, over the years, I thought, man, that's, that's fantastic. You know, I was just lucky, just in the right place at the right time in the right outfit. That was perfect. You, your performance was amazing because to not only perform the way you did, but to know the, just to know the words and to know, how, you know, how to uh, uh, sing live, because uh, I've sang a little bit, nothing like you, but that, we were talking about how impressive that was that you had learned yeah. so much so quick. And also how yeah. was your, after that, I know there was a little bit of tension, but, but Robert Palmer, you know, awesome talent. Uh, did you ever talk to him after the, after the incident? There was no tension. There mm -hmm. was not an ounce of tension. There, there was concern that they've got a tour booked and they didn't have a singer. Yeah. The minute I came um, in, you know, I'm an actor. I've been an actor since I was eight years old. So I know yeah. how to learn lines and I know how to deliver a performance when they need it. Because that's what the acting is all about, is being able to memorize the stuff, find a character and portray it. You can't say, oh, I forgot that bit. Hang on. You know, so my discipline from drama school was very helpful here. I've been singing in bands since, what, 1972? And this is 85? Sure. This is nothing new mm -hmm. to me. I played arenas that big, you know, mm -hmm. uh, supporting Deep Purple or Sabbath or whoever. So I, I was familiar with the territory and nothing scares me about that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it wasn't, you know, it's three songs. Um, I felt blessed and lucky more than I felt nervous. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you've, I think in order to do what I've done, in, in my life, I think you have to have an enormous amount of self-confidence. That doesn't mean ego. Yeah. That means that you're confident that you can do what's required. You know, I'm a worker in the trenches of rock and roll. And um, I always thought of myself like that. If I'm an actor, I'm collaborating. You know, I've done you know, the MacGyver, the, this infamous character Murdoch that I created. And now I'm doing it again on the reboot of MacGyver. And in fact, it's I'm on so excited. Guys. Yeah, you'll yeah, you, you love it. I kill at least 20 people. We're Very definitely going to talk. We're definitely going to talk about <laughs> that and bring that up. You're, you're, who yeah. were, who were people that you really, that really touched you? You obviously, uh, the Zeppelin, Sabbath, some of my favorite groups. Uh, I have a really eclectic taste, but uh, I, I love those groups. Who were, I don't see much eclectic. I don't see much eclecticism between Black Sabbath and Black Sabbath. Yeah, I know. No, I, but I like both. Of them, but I also I think like if both. Said, if you said Sir Tom Jones. Yeah, it's but I like I, I, I like Mozart and Tupac too, so that's pretty eclectic. <laughs> but Wolfgang uh, the rapper, yeah, yeah, there good. you go. Who were groups that really <laughs> kind of led the way for you, or people that you looked up to that really helped your career, uh, either personally or just by their talents? Oh God, that's a that's a wide and sweeping um, question. That's about my influences and who has helped me. That's mm -hmm. Sometimes two different things. True. What I was influenced by was the blues and Muddy Waters, really, and mm -hmm. John Lee Hooker, and that feel of the blues. Motown, I loved as a kid. So I loved soul and I loved punk. I loved punky bands. I loved Rod. I loved Mick. I loved uh, the power and glory of Led Zeppelin. But I was a child actor, you know. So I was in that in 1966. I did to show with love with Sidney Poitier. So I, I came out of drama school and went into the movies. And uh, at the same time, adoring the blues. And, I, and because London at that time, all young men and women that loved music were forming bands, mm -hmm. as you know. And yep. some of those bands conquered the world, you yep. know, and changed the world culturally. So as the culture changed, I changed, you know. And as, as I grew into the 
of the musical world, I did a nude musical in London in mm-hmm. 68, something like that, maybe, maybe, maybe a little later. And Andrew Lloyd Webber of Jesus Christ Superstar fame was in the audience and he said, you, <laughs> you should have a band. Wow. And he put together a band for me. And Amazing. I, we went, yeah, and I went to Purple Records that was Deep Purple's vanity label. Mm-hmm. And we supported Deep Purple and went to Japan. Boom. That was it. Within three months of me leaving the musical, I was in Tokyo in a rock band with eye makeup and a bottle of Jack Daniels. So it's all been kind of like an amazing amazing kind of journey. But inspirationally, music-wise, Lil Richard, Chuck Berry, all soul, early rock and roll uh, musicians were the ones that that really made me, Otis Redding, Sam Cooke, those are the people that made me want to sing. Mm. And then the lifestyle Mm. took over. Then the decadence came in, the velvet sure. pants, the, the, the makeup, the, the incredible, well, you know, how I met Miss Pamela, the queen of the groupies yeah. in Los mm-hmm. Angeles. You know, the lifestyle became as important as the songs. Are you thinking about that? <laughs> yes. Lawrence. <laughs> Lawrence. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Yeah. yeah. So it was all the music and the performances and the traveling was all one big, beautiful thing. You know, I never separated anything. I was just living from second to second uh, with this music in my heart, you know, in my blood, my veins, and throbbing with a bass drum, you know. Mm-hmm. And as Miss Pamela put it in one of her books, rock and roll's heart beats below your waist. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking, speaking of your, your musical career, um, just to go back a bit, you had mentioned being an actor at a very young age that you started mm. with acting. When did the music come into it, or was it something that you you started both at a young age and they kind of just merged together for you? Well, I didn't, you know, as I took this, he said when I was at boarding school, um, there was a friend of mine who who turned me on to Sonny Boy Williamson and Muddy Waters and uh, African American blues music, and I always loved it. But I was an actor. I was a young actor from the age of eight. So I did commercials and I acted. And I never really thought about, wow, should I play rock and roll? Until I was cast in the nude musical that I did. And I was playing an androgynous rock star. What a shock. (laughs) Um, (laughs) His name was Rose. And, uh, you know, we were naked every night, you know, in front of a a very sort of upper class audience. It was so ironic. You know, yeah, and and I and I attached all of these things together: the nudity, the the exposure, if you're pardon the pun, of of your true self, of singing, and and as I said, Andrew Lloyd Webber saw me in this thing and said, "You're a rock star. You know, let's get a band together, see what happens." And that's what we did. So it was very much allied. It was it wasn't? I never thought about it. None of these things have ever had a plan or a strategy. God forbid. Yeah. It just happened. (laughs) It just, you know, it just fell into place and sometimes fell out of place, you know, too. Oh, sure. You, you're, people don't realize how busy you've been. You, you've met pretty much every rock person at work. You've, you've written song, great songs. You've had so many groups. And boy, you start, you know, I'm looking at some of the things I writ, wrote down last night. Uh, a yeah. movie that I'm going to watch to try to find you is Dead, uh, Drop Dead Darling with Tony Curtis. Uh, it says you have an uncredited appearance in that. But you have been in so many, I think it said 100 different productions you have been on television and on movies and now obviously Mm. you have that recurring role because of your talent and your brilliance in MacGyver and tell us about that amazing experience creating this character that has really touched if you look on it's he's Murdoch is a cult figure and and it's really someone said Murdoch is the greatest villain on tv that's ever been created on a tv show I agree (laughs) <laughs> Great villain. One of yeah, I agree too. I agree too. An amazing villain. Oh, thank you, Florence. That's very sweet of you. What happened was um, the tour was over. I had a white Rolls Royce, vintage, beautiful. I got an audition from uh, my agents who set up the tour for the power station. Said, "Look, there's a character in it. This show, MacGyver, is a big hit show. It's the second season with Richard, and everybody was loving it. It was right after Monday Night Football. People went crazy for it." Sure. And there's a villain in there. There's a killer in there. It's just one episode. 
and uh, would you like to go in? Then my agent said, there's a scene in there where you have to be in drag. I said, I've been in drag my entire life. (laughs) So so I don't think we should really need to worry about that. So then I went in, and as I came under the lot at Paramount, I can see it in my mind right now. I'm in a black leather outfit. I get out of the white Rolls Royce. The producers are standing outside the door. They're all smoking. They look at me and go, hire him. (laughs) (laughs) So I got the gig, and the fans loved it, and I came back, and that was the next six years of my life. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's an amazing role. I think that what yeah, I... Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, isn't it fun? I, I, I remember, I forgot who the actor was. I think it was Robert De Niro who said, I love playing the bad person. <laughs> he goes, you know, being the hero isn't that much fun. He said, when you play the villain and you play the bad person, you can really show off your talents. And that's what I like about Murdoch. Murdoch is just really has that evilness in it, but it's just really subtle. And it's really, at times it's in your face, but at times it's just really a genius role. And I really think you play it to, to a, a T. It, it's, it's I think there's two things, you know, about villains. One is you don't care whether you live or die. Mm. So mm. There, there are no stakes. You can do whatever the f- please. Yeah. You can kill them. You can let them go. It doesn't matter because you loathe yourself to such a degree. But with Murdoch, I found there was a vulnerability every now and then that he did come back to humanity and he did feel something for people and then it would disappear. And, and that, those two things have, uh, you know, paid the rent. <laughs> I think it did a little more than that. You did, but you well, not not really, not really. I mean, in the end, you do it. You love it in the moment. You get a check and you move on to the next thing. I'm not precious about any of it. I was very grateful sure. for them to cast me, and I love playing him. And now I'm playing a very similar role again on the reboot. I don't think any actor has ever done that with a 30 year gap. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask you. I was going to ask you if that's ever happened before on TV because I I don't remember that ever happening. No, Florence, I think you're right. I I I don't I can't think of any actor that's done that. And that's sort of interesting, isn't it? That I'm still. And that's there. a credit to you and your talent, though. That's a credit to uh, you that they yeah, want you to come back. I'm I'm, I'm I've been lucky, but. David Desmalchin, who plays Murdoch in the reboot, is fantastic. And he's a wonderful actor. And what happened was, when that first season of the reboot came out, a lot of people were very angry because they love Richard. Richard Dean Anderson did not like the reboot, and he made that very clear to his fans, which put them in a very precarious and difficult situation. I, however, when I saw David Desmalchin play Murdoch, I said and tweeted out, because I'm very, you know, I've worked. Uh, not work even, but I communicate with a lot of people on social media and I love uh, doing that. And and I get such, you know, wonderful vibes back from people. But I said, he's great. (laughs) Watch this show. Right. And so that was, again, you know, I'm not protecting the brilliance of the first one. It's a completely different entity. And I think that CBS were charmed by that because he was very upset because people were saying, you're not murder, blah, blah, blah. Michael De Blas. And, and then after that, when I tweeted out that I said, he's cool, then the whole thing changed for him. Right? Mm-hmm. So they got hold of me and said, well, classy guy. Second season, I get a call from my agent saying, would you like to go to Atlanta and do this? And I said, of course I would. Oh, that's fantastic. That's, that's, um, I think also what, what, and, and just for those, uh, a lot of our friends were huge Twitter people. Uh, You could get Michael on Twitter at capital M capital D is in Danny E S B A R R E S. And he's a great follow. He's very active. He responds. He, and he's got a great show, which we're going to talk about as well. But what I love about the MacGyver series is I'm I'm kind of like a lot of fans, uh, Michael. I don't like all these remakes and all these reboots because I think they just throw it out there to get millennials to watch. And, but I, I'm telling you, this is this is a special remake. I think out of all the TV shows, this is the best remake. Uh, because Me too. Really good, I, yeah, I, I agree. I people. love Lucas. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and Meredith Eaton is a brilliant actress. Um, and, you know, I think it's uh, Justin. They're all really, really talented um, people. Um, and more importantly, the writers. The writers really know what they're doing. They've written me this episode that's on April 5th on CBS at 8 p.m. that is so cool. 
you know, it's so, they wrote it for me and I, you know, I, when I read it, I, I was so moved that they would pay attention to what I can do. Yeah, and there they put it in there, and that's pretty cool. Any which way you look at <laughs> that it, is, sure. that is you know, that they that they would do that, and you know it's doing tremendously well. Peter Lenkoff, um, the executive producer, also cre- recreated Hawaii Five-O and Magnum, mm-hmm. and you know, and he's having tremendous success. People, it's not the same thing. You're not corrupting the original. You're doing a different version. I always make the example. Hey, man, you know I've seen Hamlet. 20 times. Mm -hmm. It was written 500 years ago. If you can reproduce one of the greatest plays ever made, you certainly can reproduce a TV show. Oh, sure. I think that as long as it's quality, as long as it has good writers, obviously, and good acting, I love it. I love the remakes. But when they do the remakes and they just throw it together for a buck, that's what really gets me. But this remake is uh, special. And I I have to be, (laughs) maybe I'm going to get killed after this podcast, but I like this one tad better. I mean, that, that's how much yeah. I really like this one. Well, that, so. that's amazing to hear. And it's not the first time I've heard it. Yeah, you know, so. I, I, think, I think it was fascinating, though, but you've got to think about the era, mm-hmm. you know, itself. You know, we're talking about the mid-'80s. The mid-'80s whole cultural zeitgeist is very different from what it is in 2019. Mm-hmm. We are now living in fear uh, and division and inequality. And, I, and, and to put it absolutely clear a disaster is what's happening to our culture right now it's a different vibe yep it was a more innocent time oh, richard yeah. dean anderson could go around with no weapons mm-hmm. well think about that today mm-hmm. weapons and handguns and guns this, these are instruments of death yeah, yeah it's a yeah. different world it's a harder sharper more disastrous uh, culture that we live in so and I think entertainment to a great degree is escapist, but I think it also has to address what's happening mm-hmm. in the world, you know, and I, and I think that they do a great job of that. Yeah, it's just a TV show, but those people who create that show and write that show, they care about what's happening in our world. And I think that, you know, Lucas is a very innocent, beautiful guy mm-hmm. and it comes across. He cares. Mm-hmm. He has morality. He's with his father. You know, it's, it's a very interesting um, look at it, and I I respect those people who, who create that show and recreated that show. Yeah, both shows really good. I, I I've really enjoyed both shows over the years, and I'm pretty tough. I don't watch a lot of network TV and stuff, but I really like it. Another thing that everyone needs to watch and need to we well, can't watch it. You have to listen to it. Michael has a great show. It's called Little Steven's Underground Garage. It's on Sirius XM Radio Channel Twenty One. <laughs> It's weekdays 8 to 11 a.m. Eastern time and 9 to midnight uh, Pacific time. And I'm telling you, if you think this is fun, what we're doing here, his show is amazing. And he's got great personality, great things he talks about. And if you look at his bio, please go on Wikipedia or anywhere you will just see why we are this excited because this is one of the most talented guys to come along Hollywood and in the music industry in decades. This guy is legit. So well, I, thank I, you. I'm just lucky. I've been very lucky, dude. You know, you were just so sweet to go on about this, but you know, IMDB, if you go there, by the way, that stands for I Michael Debar. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But I've just been really lucky, man. You know, and the radio show. You're very talented too. You're being very modest. You are. You are very talented because I don't think you can have a career span this long and do so many different things. I mean, you're a musician. You're an actor. You've done so much. You you have to have talent. So you need to accept yep. the fact that you're talented, <laughs> and that's why you've lasted this long. See, we're used to, uh, yeah. Michael, we're used to talking to Americans who keep saying how great they are. So, yeah, you know. well, yeah, what can I say? I, I you, would never say anything bad about anyone. But I, I would say, though, that the radio program is very, very good for me. Because if ever I do go over the line in terms of egoically and, and being self-obsessed and, and that selfie consciousness is how I describe it. Mm-hmm. But by playing other music, Music that isn't mine is an enormous um, uh, feeling because you're not obsessed with your own work. 
you're, you're championing this, this incredible rock and soul music that you won't hear anywhere else than Little Stephen's Underground Garage. Little Stephen is my boss, Stephen Van Zandt, of course, um, mm-hmm. who's a brilliant artist in his own oh, right, wow. and that plays with Springsteen and has written so many songs with Bruce and four others and himself, and has an album out called Summer of Sorcery, which is killer. Little Stephen and the Disciples of Soul. So he's been an enormous mentor to me as a DJ mm-hmm. to play music and talk about music and talk about the roots of music. And this week I'm focusing on Lenny Bruce, you know, the great uh, satirist and um, oh, sure. cultural revolutionary. So it's not just Little Richard. It's, it's, a, it's an ethos of authentic Americana, really, is what our show is. And it's odd and ironic that I, an Englishman who has lived here 50 years, you know, can talk about this stuff. Um, and the history of rock and roll is very important to enjoy the music better when it's set in a context that the audience can, from the color of Mick Jagger's socks when they did, you know, Satisfaction, mm-hmm. to Little Richard, gay, black man, born in Macon, Georgia, in the 50s, you know, playing yeah. in the 50s. Duke, Duke yeah. George. I mean, mm-hmm. all of these things are important. And I think, you know, we have a, you know, five million people listen. <laughs> every day so it's a great responsibility there it is and i think it just shows i was reading michael that for the first time in the history of music classic music which is music that's over 20 years old is outselling new music and i think it's yeah. because people are are longing for the day when the music was raw and passionate and heartfelt and it wasn't auto tune or or and no offense to any musician today there are some good musicians and good great talent but boy when you when you look at the uh old people i was just looking you know listening to charlie parker and and gene krupa and all these amazing talents that who touched so many lives with the music that they did just decades ago so the history is what i love about your show and you embrace it celebrate it and you share it and i think it's a great great uh uh, thing that you're doing especially for younger listeners we've turned on well that's exactly right you're exactly right jim because it is for the younger listener because i want them to appreciate what happened and therefore enjoy music that they thought they might not and if i can make it clear who brother ray charles was what he had to deal with what little richard had to deal with what chuck berry had to do what the stones what the all of these Motown, Motown is one of the most important institutions because it brought black artists into the forefront of the culture. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about civil rights now. We're talking about equality here. So believe it or not, the Supremes were supreme in the fact that they became stars. Yeah. And they were accepted by white audiences. You know, that to me is very, very important. That this is a, a subject that is not a throwaway three chord, you know, let's on to the next piece of crap, you know. Yeah. This is this music was made from blood, sweat and tears, man, in yeah. studios with tiny rooms for no money. Those artists wouldn't be paid. There was rip offs, there was incredible stories that surround the history and birth of rock and roll and soul music. Oh, you know, yeah. Sam Cooke was assassinated. Yeah. Because he was a black guy with a publishing empire and a and a record deal hanging out with Malcolm X. Yeah. Oh, right. You know, in the sixties, mm-hmm. sure, that's going to happen. Yeah. So yeah. he was uh, he was off by some entity, uh, in my view. Um, it, it might not be yours, but that's my one view. of my one of my favorite is. singers of all time. He's he's uh, yeah, no question. Uh, Sam yeah. Cooke taught everybody how to sing. Yeah, he I was mean, amazing. you know, the mm-hmm. effortless brilliance and soul of Sam Cooke is what I try to, uh, you know, when I sing ballads. I mean, I'm a rock singer. I'm not a soulful crooner, mm-hmm. but um, every now and then, man, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you throw a Sam Cooke uh, ad lib or something, you know, and just try and um, channel him. But point being is. Yeah, Little Chief's Underground Garage, really important place to listen to music. I strongly advise you to do so. You're going to see in the following months, as we do with all of our guests, we are going to promote a lot of the stuff they're doing, and we really encourage all of you to get to know this man because he is a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of history, and you will have a blast. I love his comments. I love a lot of his views, but... I have to be a little more politically correct, so I'm not going to say too much. But uh, I think he he just has a lot. He's right on in so many things. And uh, Well, you know, let's just talk about that for a second. When you say politically correct, 
I am sociologically and humanistically, I have my own correct. Mm-hmm. You know? So when I see ugliness and when I see inequality, and when I see women not being paid as much as men, when I see children abused, when I see opiates mm-hmm. flowing from these pharmacological companies, that's mm-hmm. not political. Yeah. That's humane. It's I, a big yeah. difference. I don't ever say in the White House and why he's in the White House. I don't talk about him. Yeah. And I don't talk about all of the people that I do not dig. I talk about the people I do dig. Yeah. And I talk about the subjects that really uh, I think we should be actively involved in. For instance, you know, um, the arts. Mm-hmm. Stephen Van Zandt has two different entities. One is teachrock.org. That means that these teachers are not being paid. They are undervalued. Mm -hmm. They are underpaid. He also has another foundation called Little Kids Rock, which is getting instruments into schools. Now, these for the kids. You can get a gun. Where's the saxophone? So these things are Mm -hmm. on my mind. And, you know, way past the fact that I I did, you know, Melrose Place. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, it's meaningless. You know, what means something is, and that's what the radio program gives me an opportunity about, not to talk about politics, but to, you know, if I listen to a, sh- a song by, you know, I don't know, Sam Cooke, I can talk about it. You know, I don't just put it in there. I've, I find that it's all piece of the same thing. You know, I can get my points across uh, that I feel about our culture and how to make it better, which is through love and compassion and kindness. That's right. And I do that through the power of rock and roll. Yeah, we do it through the power of our medium. And again, we're very uh, appreciative of Michael and all the things he's done, appreciative of all our guests. And, and I, the kindness that all of you have shown us is just so amazing and it blows us away. We really try hard with these shows and we really great. appreciate good our, our guests. And we really, again, Michael is, is good people and we want everyone to support him and everyone to go on his show and, and learn something. Cause I, I learned something every time I listened to him and boy, love on him. And I think the episode's April 5th, watch him on MacGyver and you're just going to say, wow, even if you're not a fan of the show, you will be. So Michael, will be. Yeah. Michael, you are just, you, you've got two huge, I'm not a fan boy. I don't usually yeah. do this, but I think you're amazing. And I really am a big fan of yours. And I, and I, just your hope, Thank I you, hope, Jim. I Thank hope you. that you always know that you have a soft place to land here and you could come on anytime you want or anything you want to talk about. You have two friends right here. And again, you're going to probably be sick of us a little bit in the next few months promoting a lot of his things, but please, <laughs> please uh, support him. Well, God bless you both. And Florence, I yes. hope you feel better, sweetheart. I hope you feel better um, with your orange juice and your teas and that um, some <laughs> Thank you. rock and roll will fly into you and you'll feel spectacular. As soon as you hang out with me, you're going to just fly. you fly around. around. <laughs> Where's Florence? Oh She's on the ceiling. Is where <laughs> right. That's right. Well, just thank you so good. much. You thank, you thank you for coming you on. Much. We love you too. Thank Take you. Care. Okay. Peace and love. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michael. Bye-bye. Wow, Florence. That was pretty special. Uh, wow. That I'm, was. I'm kind of tingling a little bit. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I think what when you get people, see, people would say, oh, get Brad Pitt or Michael Jordan or what. First of all, they wouldn't come on our show. But second of all, <laughs> I would rather talk to Michael for hours on end. He would get sick of me, but I would rather talk to Michael for hours on end than any of the superstars that are out there now. And no offense to anybody, but boy, these are the kinds of people to me, they're good hearted people, they're kind people, they care about our culture, they care about history. And again, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. We're gonna have those sites up, we're gonna make sure everyone knows about them. It's a horrible thing that it's easier at times to get weapons or be violent and, and we can't apply our schools. Mike Trout, and I don't blame Mike Trout. He's, you know, great guy. He seems he does a lot for people and he's a good, and he's a good person. But when a baseball player is getting $430 million, almost half a billion dollars and we can't yeah. pay teachers or we can't supply schools, the one to get two on a, a soapbox, but I'm telling you that it, it really, really bothers me because music does something music is like food it brings people to, of all cultures and all feelings together and i think if we cherish whether you like rock or you like jazz or mozart or whatever tupac uh if you if we could just get in 
a stadium where all of us can play instruments or sing or enjoy it, boy, it would bring a lot of peace to this world and a lot of kindness. And uh, that's what I love the yeah. that Michael does. And please don't miss his radio show and definitely don't miss him on MacGyver. DVR it if you're working or doing something else. But wow. Yeah, I agree. This is a great get. Uh, I, I love guys like this. I agree. This is definitely one of our best. I think he is so interesting, so talented. And I agree. I'd rather talk to somebody like Michael, who I as well could talk to for hours because he has such an amazing history. He has such a rich and amazing history. His career has spanned over so many years, and he's done so much. He's contributed so much. And you know my background is in education, is in teaching, special education. And I agree. When you can't supply children with musical instruments, when you can't pay teachers a fair wage, when you can't pay women equally. So I, I agree with everything you said and everything Michael said. And yes, this was definitely um, one of the best interviews. And I'm, I'm really excited to share it with everyone. Now, before I brag about, about him anymore, I'm going to give you a list of all the shows before we go. Uh, Seinfeld, Renegade, Alf, Ellen, Nip and Tuck, Just Shoot Me, Heart to Heart, my Sister Sam, Lois and Clark, MacGyver, obviously, Jag, Melrose Place, Nash Bridges, Northern Exposure, which was really popular at the time, Rockford Files, yeah. a cl classic, Sledgehammer, uh, St. Elsewhere, which was also a big show, Sliders, 21 Jump Street, The Pretender, Dead Like Me, Frasier, Hawaii Bones, N NCIS, and I'm telling you, <laughs> WKRP in Cincinnati, those are the shows that he's done. He, he's done things with T Tony Curtis, with Clint Eastwood. I mean, so many, Don Johnson, and you see so many people. Uh, he played in the Viper Room. That was the sad place yeah. where uh, John, yeah. I think Johnny Depp had owned it. But, boy, I'm telling you, you know, Friends of the Sex Pistol uh, played with people from Duran Duran, as we talked about, Sex Pistols. Uh, so many, Power Station, obviously, and uh, just he, Blondie. He's he's uh, Todd uh, uh, Tony Sales of Todd Rudgren, uh, Glenn Burke, uh, Nigel Harrison. I mean, so many people. That's just, goes on forever. The yeah, list can go on. This is, just, this is just a tad of what he's done. So with people like this, if you support us in any way, please support him because he deserves it. Yeah. Just, that list just blows me away. So uh, this is one of the most hardworking, talented people that have been in Hollywood for a long time. He isn't going to go out and get an Oscar. He isn't going to do all, but he has brought so many smiles to so many people's faces. Wow. Yes. And his character on MacGyver, the villain Murdoch, I could see him definitely getting an Emmy at some point, only because it is one of the best villains. I agree with that. And he originated it, and he was so good at it, they asked him to come back. So that says a lot right there. Uh, yeah, because you know how age, you know, ageism is in Hollywood uh, with a lot of people. And Michael's a good-looking guy. He's, he's spry. He's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, he's just got that energy and that great English wit. And boy, I'm telling you that for him to come back and if you really like the mental game, when you look at some of these people, great writing, you could really get into Murdoch because it's just an evil, you know, at times, like he said, there's times where he shows a, a little humanity and there's, and, but most of the times there's just an evilness to him that is at times yeah. subtle, at times in your face, just a great, great, uh, characters. And finally, last but not least, go on youtube and find that clip from 1985 live aid uh you could either put power station or michael's name and it, i'm telling you he blows it away he, he just did amazing job he did it on last second last second mm -hmm. notice robert palmer you know kind of uh, he didn't want to do it he, he wanted to go back in the studio and do his own thing which is okay you know they're temperamental but robert palmer awesome talent in his own right but for him michael to step up and do such a great job wow uh, that was one of the great performances and we're talking i love when people say well jay-z got twenty thousand. this show was so popular what they did with live aid is they had a, a stadium filled at jfk stadium in philly i believe and also at wembley both stadiums singing they had bands going on at the same time they even had i believe it was mick jagger and oh gosh i can't remember who else it was singing at the same time and david bowie 
singing at the same time wouldn't you know it was very interesting but they were in different places and the world was so enamored with this they started having concerts also so not only those two huge concerts that were televised and seen by almost two billion people what happened is countries all over the world had concerts at the same day to kind of support it so it was an amazing feat, amazing thing. And if you go online, what, that's obviously when Queen did their greatest performance of all time, which many think with the, uh, the late, amazing Freddie Mercury. So, wow. When you study Michael, you just really get excited because there's so many great things to look at. But So much boy, history. So much uh, history. Unbelievable. But anyway, thank you all for all you do. Uh, Florence, this, we're really on, this is supposed to be kind of the calm season for podcasts for some podcasters, but we're just getting started. We got so many, yeah, not for us, <laughs> just getting started, but it's because of you that we're doing this. So take care. We love you guys. Peace. Yeah. And please get on Twitter and give us a hi or I, I love all your DMS. I love 99% of them. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I do love all the co um, positive comments we've been getting. We've been getting so much positive feedback, so much love from everyone. So definitely keep that coming as well. Yes, because I'm very insecure and I need all that positivity. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, take care, everyone. 